Welcome to At The Letters opening week edition of the podcast here on Sportsnet's podcast platforms, wherever you find your podcasts. I'm Ben Nicholson-Smith, along with Arden Welling. This week's episode produced by Christian Ryan and Nick Andrade as we get ready for opening day. And Arden, you are still in Florida, still in spring training, but we are on the brink of baseball that actually counts. How are you holding up? Uh, I'm holding up well. We made it. Almost all of the Blue Jays pitching staff made it as well. So uh, we're feeling good. You know, that's actually exactly where I want to start. And I don't no want kidding. to be... <laughs> you don't say. I, I don't want to be super hyperbolic in this. But when I look at how this unfolded Monday in Bradenton with Kevin Gosman and the Blue Jays, it's actually pretty significant to me. And it, it sort of changes things for me when I look at this team because going back a couple of weeks you look at Kevin Gosman the uncertainty surrounding his timeline to the major leagues and the fact that he was not really off a mound or certainly not in games until the very very final day of spring training games it was hard to know what to expect from him and in the absence of clear information there you kind of have to assume that the Jays are going to have to figure it out on the fly and that things are not going according to plan. But he gets out there on a mound against the Pittsburgh Pirates on Monday, and he looked great. Connor Joe with the pitch. Swing and a miss, struck him out. He threw a fastball right down the middle. And Kevin Gosman is on it today. He's got seven strikeouts through three innings. We'll go to the Like, board. his stuff was there. He was up to 96, 97 miles an hour. He was throwing his slider and his splitter for strikes, getting swing and miss. This is exactly what you'd want to see from Kevin Gosman if you're the Jays. So as far as spring training developments, like I actually think final day of spring, Kevin Gosman finally returning to a mound, that to me was one of the bigger developments of the entire spring training. Well, I remember when we talked about this last week, two weeks ago, it's kind of, you know, it all blends together here in Florida, but I I gave it like a 10% chance of Gosman being ready for the first turn in the rotation. And you were like... Pfft. No chance. No way. Um, and you, that's a bit of a role reversal for us, right? Like usually you leave the door a little bit open and I'm like, no chance. Um, so that like that kind of tells you like how unlikely it was that Kevin Gosman would be able to get ready for for the first turn of the rotation. Um, I think it's important to remember as well, like he is very much driving this process. Like Blue Jays are taking a lot of risk by allowing him to do this and i'm sure that there's plenty of folks in the training department and uh, the medical department who are like are we sure about this and kevin gosman is very sure of it and like you said it's hard to deny the results the stuff was electric like he was just vaporizing dudes in in bradenton um he was not happy with his splitter which was like kind of funny to me because i was like what's a good splitter to you if that wasn't a good splitter like it was upper 80s and a bunch of them are carrying the zone and uh you know getting some really awkward swings um i thought he located some really good fastballs as well into left-handed hitters like that's such an important pitch for him just to keep those lefties from hanging out over the plate but um you know gosman is like the blue jays originally had gosman lined up the pitch on the minor league side on that day and he pushed to pitch in a major league game he wanted to be on the mound against pirates hitters he didn't want to do another backfield thing or another minor league you know sim environment anything like that the blue jays definitely wanted to control it a bit more but i think osman proved that he's ready um you know if he's only 70 75 pitches in that first turn of the rotation I mean, you'll take 70, 75 pitches of that version of Kevin Gosman over, I don't know, 98% of pitchers in Major League Baseball. For sure. I mean, he's he's as good as it gets. And you were looking at replacing him with like some combination of Mitch White, maybe Trevor Richards comes in. That is a big difference, right? To go from one of the elite starting pitchers in Major League Baseball to basically guys who are you know long relievers you know maybe a starting pitcher in Mitch White's case but huge amounts of uncertainty there so to get Gosman on a mound built up to 53 pitch 52 pitches is step one but then beyond that for his stuff to look as good as it did the secondary stuff as you're saying with the splitter look really good and I just keep coming back to the fastball velo because you know if he's 95, 96, and again, he was up to 96.9 miles an hour on Monday against the Pirates, 
then that just gives him that much more room for error. He falls behind against Raddy Telez. It's 2-0. It's 2-1. You've got to get back into the count. But if you're throwing 93, Major League hitters are going to have a pretty good chance against that pitch. Doesn't mean they're going to hit them all for, for rockets to the wall or over the wall, but they're going to have a pretty good look at that pitch in a hitter's count. But if you're up to 95, 96 miles an hour, it just gives you that much more room for error. And I saw Gosman use that really effectively. And I think that's a great sign for for the Jays as they move forward. So, you know, next time out after throwing 52 pitches, you know, like you say, like maybe it's 70, 75, maybe it's more like 65, 70, you know, whatever it is, he's probably not getting through more than four innings unless he's hyper efficient. But you still do have eight other relievers to go to. And, uh, you know, to get Gosman, maybe it's four the first time, five the second time, and then you're kind of rolling this is, I mean, even two starts from Kevin Gosman versus Mitch White. I actually think that's a pretty big difference. Yeah, and you're going to want to be mindful about where you place them in the rotation. Um, I don't, like, you want to be careful that you maybe don't have them go in, like, a day game after a night game where the night game is started by somebody who you're not going to trust to turn a lineup over two full times. Uh, like, you just have to be careful with how you sort of deploy your innings to begin the year. Um, I think that the Blue Jays' preference would be to have Gosman pitch the fourth game of the season at the Trop uh, and face the Rays and keep him away from the Astros. Uh, we'll see. It's going to depend on how he responds to the outing on Monday. We're recording this Tuesday, March 26th in the morning, and uh, we don't have access to the to the uh, facility down here in Florida. Like, there's no avails. We're, we're not going to be around the club. So I uh, can't really, like, give a report on, you know, how he responded and how he bounced back from it. Um, but if he bounced back well, I think the Blue Jays can just place him, you know, where they ideally, and optimally want him to be in the rotation and where it makes sense from a workload standpoint for everyone else on the staff. But if he needs an extra day, um, if he's hanging a little bit and you want to be cautious and bump him to that fifth spot in the rotation, could have him going after Bowden Francis in, in game number four. And then there's kind of a question of how much you need to use your bullpen over the first three games of the season and then how much uh, length you need behind Francis, like how deep you're going to let him get into an outing so there's like a lot of variables at play but I mean as long as Kevin Gosman is performing and looking the way that he did in Bradenton by the way like his first time this spring pitching with a pitch clock and with umpires watching his delivery for box and and all of the different like variables that you get in a big league environment and there were no issues with any of that for Gosman as long as he's he's looking that way like this is a, a big boon to a Blue Jays team that wants to get off to a strong start this year in the rotation right now I mean it's kind of just your five best starters in the organization right like I mean Alec Manoa this point you know he certainly has reached some really good heights but I think just given what his last six seven months have looked like um, that puts some question as to what it is that he's able to offer so you look at the guys who are in there Bowden Francis of course the the fifth uh, starter in that group along with the more established four who were able to start 120 plus games for the Blue Jays last year I mean that's a really strong group so I think if you're the Jays uh, there's a lot of reason to be optimistic about what that starting rotation can do out of the gate so then you look in contrast to that in the bullpen and this is where the Jays are going to start with a couple of their top relievers like literally their two best relievers are in all likelihood going to be on the injured list to start the year Jordan Romano Eric Swanson they're both banked up. We're not able to finish spring training strong. And so that means, and we haven't seen the official roster announcement, the Jays still working through this, but based on the, the indications that we're getting from manager John Schneider, certainly appears that Romano and Swanson will be on that injured list. So it kind of leads to two questions. Like one, how do you get through the highest leverage moments of games against the Rays and the Astros out of the gate? And then two, with those two spots that are open now in the in the bullpen that would have been filled otherwise by those more established relievers, how do they go about filling it? So I, I guess let's start with how the Blue Jays actually deal with those leverage innings. How do you see that unfolding? Uh, I think the Chad Green and Jimmy Garcia are the the two obvious names, and like Garcia has been just lights out 
all spring in his like first outing of spring he was like 98 99 i mean this is a guy who just came into the season ready to go uh and that's you know i actually chatted with him a little bit about it and i mean he worked really hard in this offseason to be in that position to start the year we saw him like throwing this hard and being this like intense and competitive last year Jordan Romano in the dugout after a big, big out by Jimmy Garcia. We all just sort of assumed, oh, it's because he's getting ready for the WBC. Like he's getting ramped up a bit earlier. Uh, but if you ask Jimmy, he's like, nah, man, that's just what I do. Like, that's just where I want to be at the beginning of camp. You know, he works with Frankie Montes and uh, and Dennis Santana, who's uh, in the Yankee system over the offseason. Um, they work in Arizona, and these guys throw like every day off a mound it's not you know full high intensity every day but they are getting off a mound every day even if it's just like a lighter more moderate effort um session so they keep their arms going and they uh you know they come in like ready to go from the jump in spring training so that's one of the reasons why jamie's looked as good as he has and chad green is someone who's been toying around with his breaking ball a little bit in this camp and you know i I wouldn't read too much into his results during these spring outings when he was sort of working on some things and, and trying to find some stuff like he really took the opportunity of these spring outings to just experiment and tinker with some stuff like i think you'll see a much more chad green looking chad green to start the year so those are going to be like your quote unquote replacements i guess for for swanson romano in those like highest of high leverage roles at the back end of the bullpen and and we'll see how long they have to hold that down for blue jays being interestingly coy about romano and swanson i mean they haven't even as we sit here on tuesday morning they haven't even officially said that those guys are going to open the year on the IL, but we're talking about two pitchers who haven't pitched in like two weeks. Like they haven't been off a mound in two weeks. They're only throwing from flat ground right now. I kind of heard yesterday that they might not be off a mound until a week from now. Like I'm talking the middle of next week. So I don't really understand why the Blue Jays haven't just come out and said like those guys are going to be on the IL. Maybe it's just like a spring training thing. We don't have an active roster. We don't have to tell you that much. This is just how you know we're going to play it really close to the vest. But I'm not expecting Romano and Swanson to be part of this bullpen until like at the earliest on that first homestand of the year after the long road trip. So we are talking at the earliest, the middle of April. Yeah, and teams they're they're so often just coy with this kind of information, right? Like it's we can read between the lines and really make some educated guesses here. I wonder too, this might be too deeply conspiratorial, but you know, even from a game planning standpoint, you probably want the Rays video people to be game planning for ten <laughs> relievers as opposed to eight, right? Like you probably want to sure. make their life like that much more difficult. End of the day. Like, you're not fooling anyone. The Rays can follow this, too, and they can really understand that it's it's highly unlikely. But, um, yeah, teams like to play this out until the very last minute. So, yeah. Some poor analyst making, like, 60K a year has to work through his weekend and, like, miss dinner with his wife. Oh, I believe it. I, I, (laughs) baseball's, uh, baseball's schedule is, is unrelenting. It waits for no one. Certainly not for the video analysts who are out there out there doing uh, all kinds of all kinds of work at at all hours of the day um so you know for the blue jays this means that you do have in all likelihood a couple spots at the back of their bullpen and we'll, let's work off that assumption here so to me when i look at this like we can sit here and talk all day about zach pop and nate pearson and okay like maybe one of those guys will be on the roster Maybe a Brendan Little will be on the roster. There's opportunity there. But to me, I just look at Yariel Rodriguez in this as the most interesting arm. And to be honest with you, the more I've thought about it, Arden, the more I actually think, like, put him in there. You're trying to win games at the Major League level. It's really tough to do. He's a Major League arm. I understand there's a counter argument to be made here developmentally. And there is potentially a downside to having him in the major leagues where he cannot get as many innings as regularly after a season in which he did not pitch professionally. But to me, when I look at the pros and cons and when I look at a team that might miss or make the playoffs by a single game in 2024, if it's me, I'd rather do that with Yoel Rodriguez as opposed to Zach Pop. 
So let's build this thing out, right? We've got Garcia and Green at the very back end. We've got the lefties in Mesa and Cabrera. That's four. You've got Trevor Richards, Mitch White. That's six. I'd say those guys are all locks. I think that like Nate Pearson is like 90% lock. Um, it's not a sure thing, but I think that we should put him into like the lock category just for the sake of this discussion. Uh, so that sure. leaves that leaves one final spot. Because that's that's seven right there. So the options for that spot, as you said, Ariel Rodriguez among those options, Zach Pop as well. I don't think Brendan Little's an option at this time. Like he's somebody who the Blue Jays are high on, but like he just wasn't consistent enough with his command this spring. He's already been optioned to AAA, which tells you something. Um, and the Blue Jays have the two lefties in Mesa and Cabrera, and then Trevor Richards, who can kind of function as a lefty as well with that change up. So I don't think yeah. they need another lefty. So I'm gonna like put Little aside. And then I guess Wes Parsons is in that conversation as well. So really it is just like Rodriguez, Pop, and Parsons. I don't think the Blue Jays are in a position right now to add anyone to their 40. Right. Because they're already going to have to remove someone. Exactly. When they when they make room to break camp. It really is Rodriguez, Pop, or Parsons. I think we could put Parsons aside because that's like honestly kind of important starting pitching depth for you at this point like that's somebody who if you had an injury in your rotation in the first turn of the rotation this season parsons is probably the guy who you're calling upon he's on the roster maybe you prefer espino but espino's not on the roster so i would rather keep parsons pitching regularly just with buffalo just every five days so that he's on hand as your number six so now we're down to yariel rodriguez and zach pop and I like I think you could go either way because I think the Blue Jays are pretty they're okay lengthwise with like Mitch White and Trevor Richards like those guys can both go three innings and then Pearson Green Cabrera those guys can all go two innings or one plus at least so I think you're okay lengthwise it doesn't have to be Rodriguez Um, you could take pop um i think rodriguez is probably the better pitcher at this time probably the more useful guy at this time but as you alluded to like you are balancing what's best for your team short term with what's best for ariel rodriguez long term and like in a perfect world you would have a set schedule for rodriguez on how he's going to build up this year because you're working with limited innings remember coming off of 23 when he didn't pitch competitively after the, the wbc so it's like important to get him onto somewhat of a structured schedule where he is pitching regularly rebuilding that innings base um and just putting himself in a position to continue building throughout his deal which you know runs for seasons beyond this one um the thing is like you can only control the environment and the circumstances so much at the big league level right like you can only structure that so much you can do that much easier at triple a so it's kind of like do you want to prioritize the development and kind of getting him working regularly and working on a lot of the delivery refinements that he's going to be working on as the blue jays try to get some of that hesitation out of there and get the arm slot and release point a lot more consistent or do you bring him to the big leagues to be potentially pitching medium leverage innings for you um, while you are down a couple of your higher leverage relievers because he's like your better option to help you win games right now at the big league level? Like that's kind of the, the push pull of this. And I would imagine that there is like a lot of debate about which way is best to go within the Blue Jays organization. Yeah, I think there are compelling arguments and I definitely would acknowledge like, hey, there is a case to be made that you need to just make sure that this guy who is a long term part of your organization gets some sort of sea legs under him before you put him into the major leagues. Like I understand that's a viable argument, but end of the day, I just think that there are times in a in a team's arc where you're going to be conservative you're going to take every step and just build up super super gradually but i'm not sure that 2024 is one of those times for the jays and i'm not saying you do this with ricky tiedemann and you're like yeah we're taking tiedemann over yenesis cabrera no like that's a guy where he's 21 years old of course you need to give him some more professional experience and and some chance to actually have these reps as a as a professional but Yuriel Rodriguez does have professional experience. It didn't come last year, but he has pitched at a high level before. And he's not a kid. He's 27 years old. And he's making $32 million. So it's not even like, oh, what if we blow out his arm? Obviously, you don't want that to happen. But he's here to help the major league team win. And I think that you look at him versus 
the West Parsons, who, you know, again, I agree with you, the West Parsons actually makes more sense stretched out at AAA and, and continuing to build up and, and continuing to provide insurance. But when I look at Zach Pop, the results were not good last year. In the majors, they were not good in AAA. You look at his expected stats on his sinker. There's an ex woba of 396. That's his best pitch, and hitters were destroying it last year. So, you know, unless the Blue Jays have reason to believe that there is some significant change compared to last year, I don't look at Zach Pop as someone who is an above average major league pitcher. And I do look at Yariel Rodriguez that way. I think that he can do that, has those tools and those pitches to be able to get hitters out at the highest level. And so to me, when I'm thinking about how to win games in 2024, it's pretty clear which one of those pitchers I would choose. Yeah, and Rodriguez has demonstrated some pretty compelling stuff uh, this spring. I think you'd probably like him to be on the plate a bit more than he has been. But uh, look, his like fastball is 94, 95. At least that's where he's been sitting. And he'll get up to 97 when he needs to. He's got all those varying arm slots, which uh, you know I, I'm sure that you know pitching developers and pitching coaches probably don't love, but it definitely makes things uncomfortable uh, for for a hitter. Uh, it makes it hard to kind of think along with him and expect what's coming. And he's got some like really high spin breaking stuff that uh, breaks really sharply. He also has the uh, the benefit of surprise where um, major league hitters are not going to be like familiar with him so they're going to take some time to kind of figure him out um you know all the video on him is going to be from npb or wbc like you're not going to have an amazing scouting report on him an amazing idea of his game plan coming into it so that could be a benefit for the blue jays out of their bullpen and then obviously you know the length that he can provide would help if uh you know if if francis and kikuchi are going to be just like you know two trips and through guys and kevin gosman only has 70 75 pitches and whoever he's facing whether it's the rays or the astros best believe they're going to know that and that that is going to play into their approach against Kevin Gosman, and they're going to do everything they can to elevate that pitch count as early in the game as possible. So, like, ultimately, the the question you have to answer is just whether you can get Rodriguez regular, like, consistent, semi-predictable work in the majors as much as you can within the constraints of a big league season, or, like, if his usage would just be too sporadic based on game circumstances and needing to win games at the big league level. Um, and if that would just like derail his season and put him in a hole that he could spend the rest of the year trying to climb out from uh, at triple a. And if maybe he would just be better served with a, a more structured schedule in, in Buffalo to start the year. Here's what I would do. I would say to Yariel Rodriguez, look, we might, we have an opportunity right now. We need you right now in the major leagues. And then if he ends up excelling, you keep him in the major leagues, you roll with it, great, everyone's happy. If he ends up struggling, you set it up at the beginning where it's like, we have this we have this need for you now, we still want to make sure we get you on a proper routine, so you know, we may end up sending you to Buffalo, but for now we want you to start in the majors and we really believe in you, et cetera, et cetera. Then I would use him in low leverage. Like This is not a guy you're bringing in with a 3-1 lead in the sixth inning uh, You know, after Gosman gives you five years is not how he's going to start his professional career so you start him in low leverage you're down six to one against the Astros here he comes he pitches two maybe three innings and you see how it goes and you do have that option you can always adjust course but to me um, and it sounds like you're kind of aligned with me here correct me if if I'm wrong on that but to me I would start him in that capacity and just just let the results determine the next steps yeah, you hope that that opportunity, that low leverage opportunity presents itself for you. Um, the the games may have something else to say, right? Like at the big league level, you're just at the mercy of game flow. Uh, in AAA, you can just, you can control those things um, a lot more reliably. So I see it both ways. I think there's compelling arguments on either side. The one thing I will say is like we are seeing the Blue Jays take some risks early in the year and kind of, they're really funneling like talent to their big league roster, uh, whether or not it's like the best long-term decision to make. Like Kevin Gosman's a primary example of that like in a perfect ideal optimal world i don't know that you have you'd have kevin gosman throwing his second game of the season he made one big league appearance in spring training his second game of the season not fully stretched out coming like in a start in the big leagues in the first week of the season like that's not optimal that's not ideal but the blue jays are taking that risk because 
They want to get off to a good start and they want to win games. You look at their bench, it would have been pretty easy to just carry Nathan Lucas for the beginning of the year in that 13th roster spot or that 13th position player spot. And the Blue Jays are saying, no, we're going to take Daniel Vogel back, who we may have to pay like $2 million for the right to carry his bat uh, out of the gates because we want somebody who could put one in the seats off our bench. Like this is a guy who may not see that many plate appearances in the first week of the season, but we're going to we're going to carry Vogel back. We're going to select him to our roster. We're going to open up a 40 man spot uh, because right. like we are prioritizing winning out of the gates and being competitive out of the gates. So the fact that the Blue Jays have done that in a couple other areas of their roster tells me that they would be open to carrying Rodriguez as well. Yeah, I mean, and let's get to the bench now. But I, I guess like first to that to that theme, broadly speaking, like this is not a Blue Jays team that's going to win the East by six games. And it's not a team that's going to miss the playoffs by six games. So whatever happens, whatever you think is going to happen in this season, it's going to be pretty tense, I would think. I mean, that's a pretty reasonable guess when you look at the caliber of this team. So every single marginal win then is really significant. And so that brings us to the bench where, as you said, Vogelback will be on this team. Espinal traded. He's in Cincinnati. Ernie Clement on the team. David Schneider on the bench. Brian Servan, as predicted on ATL, will be that second catcher for now. He'll need a 40-man spot too. That's open for now. A second 40-man spot will have to be cleared. Maybe time to say goodbye to a Hagen Danner or to a Jasper Zulueta or maybe even to a Brendan Little. We will see what they do on that front. But this bench has taken shape, and I agree with you that it's really interesting to see that Daniel Vogelbach is part of this team. And I think that, look, he might not play that much. He's the 26th or 25th player on this roster. But I really think that from the day that they signed him, I thought that was a deal that made sense. I like that deal. He might not be there for that long, right? Joey Votto not close to returning as we record this, but within a few weeks, that could change. I do think Votto will get the chance to play himself off this team if and when he's healthy. And that could mean that Vogelbach is off the roster within a few weeks. But in the meantime, he is a major league bat who can really help you against quality right-handed pitching. So I actually like this call. And it does allow them to preserve depth in the organization because you still have Nathan Lucas available. So let me make a quick comment about Nathan Lucas and the 40-man spot. I don't think the Blue Jays will do this. And like the way that they'll likely open that 40-man spot, as you said, like a, a Dan or a Zulueta, I mean, one of those depth relievers maybe you think about a leo jimenez but i think they would probably go with one of the the relievers being you know moved off the roster to open that spot but something i would love to see the blue jays do is move nathan lucas to a better situation find him a better situation in, in mlb because this is a big leaguer and like i said they're not going to do it because like they i'm sure love having the depth of a nathan lucas optionable within their system are really good like outfielder base runner or really competent hitter a big league player, like a guy who came into camp and like did not only meet the Blue Jays expectations, but like exceeded them at the plate defensively, base running character, teammate, all of that, like checked all of the boxes and is just such a poor fit for the Blue Jays current roster construction because Varsho and yeah. Kiermaier are both left handed hitters and then your quote unquote fourth outfielder at least one of them and Kevin Biggio is also a lefty so there just isn't room to carry Lucas on this roster but this is a big league player and he's 29 and I just hate seeing him have to have the career that he's having right now. Like you look at the Rockies just traded for Jake cave from the Phillies for cash is Jake cave that much better than Nathan Lucas. Honestly, I think that like Nathan Lucas could have been the fit there. Um, man, the Cardinals, they got to need an outfielder right now. Newt bars on the IL Edmonds hurt. Dylan Carlson and Jordan Walker just like ran into each other in the outfield on Monday. I don't know what the fallout from that is, but it looked really nasty. Like there are opportunities elsewhere where Nathan Lucas could be an everyday big leaguer. And I would love to see that happen. I'd love to see the Blue Jays get him to that situation, but I just don't think that they will. Do you have a comment on that before I move the Vogel back? Yeah, just real quick. I mean, you could also make it mutually beneficial, right? Like if you're the Blue Jays, we're talking about how they have this question at the back of their bullpen. Like, you could do a need-for-need need trade where, let's say it's the Cardinals. That's a good example. If they have an optionable reliever then who's on their 40-man, uh, then you could do a trade where the Jays get the reliever back, 
that fills out your bullpen, gives you a legitimate competitive major league arm to go along with Pearson in those seven, eight spots in the bullpen. Now you have Uriel Rodriguez stretching out a triple A. You're keeping his development in mind. You're not rushing him. But again, it, it comes down to if you have a good alternative for the major league bullpen. So if there was a trade chip that was appealing enough, I could envision a need for need situation where Lucas goes somewhere else and does get that opportunity that you're talking about. Yeah, like a Matthew Liberator, who is kind of, I'm just quickly looking at the bat, you know, the the edge of their bullpen. Maybe. Yeah, exactly. Like, I mean, that could be a fair trade. Right? Like, that could make sense. That's a guy, that's not somebody who, you know, is going to be pitching a ton of leverage in their bullpen. That's somebody who, you know, has shown some interesting things as a pitcher, had, had a ton of prospects shine at one time. Uh, I think he's definitely past that now. Uh, still has options. Um, maybe somebody who the Blue Jays want to work with, right? So, yeah, sign me up for like getting Lucas to a better situation because I just want I just feel bad for him. Just to be completely candid, um, yeah. But the 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 Vogel back of it all is uh, like it's very interesting because like this is the position player roster spot that the Blue Jays really don't have a use for. Like they'd much rather have a pitcher, but they can only take thirteen pitchers. Uh, so if they had their druthers, they would only take twelve position players. But because they've got this thirteenth position player spot, they've like tried these very specific like tools within that spot over the last couple of years like jackie bradley jr as the like premium defender bradley zimmer is the speed demon and it seems like this year the thing that they're going to use that like the very narrow skill set they're going to use that roster spot on is um left-handed patience and pop off the bench whether that's vocal back or Votto, like clearly this is a role that they wanted to have on their bench this is like a skill set they wanted to have on their bench clearly because you've seen that in the acquisitions that they've made and the way that they forced Vogelback onto this roster even while they have Votto perhaps ready to be that guy by May we'll see how long it takes him to get over this this ankle issue so it's gonna be very interesting to see how this plays out how Vogelback performs what his opportunities look like you know he, how they get him into the starting lineup because he's only going to dh he's not going to play first base as someone told you know said to me the other day like we'd put demarlo hale at first base before we'd put daniel vogel back there <laughs> so That's like amazing. like he's he's gonna have to be a dh so that means justin turner's gonna have to be in the field or there's gonna you know he's or turner's gonna have to be on the bench um like we'll see how the blue jays construct that um, we'll see what the pinch hit opportunities look like for him. There's also Vogelback's salary at play here, which is going to be $2 million at the big league level whenever his contract is selected ahead of opening day. And um, the only way like the Blue Jays would have around paying him that full $2 million is if he signed a 45-day advance consent form, which uh, like we could really get into the nitty-gritty of, of those roster rules. But like the high level is that it would give the Blue Jays like a 45-day window in which they could outright him off the roster, revert the deal back to a minor league deal, and only pay him the prorated amount of those $2 million. So if he was in the big leagues for, say, the month of April, and then they outrighted him, they would owe him one-sixth of the two mil, so $333,000. And then at that point, if Joey Votto was ready and productive and they felt he was a better option, bring up Joey Votto on his $2 million salary. And, you know, just over the course of the season, he only end up spending the $2 million on that spot. I don't know that Vogelback has signed that form. Um, it is something that players in his position are often asked to sign by teams because players in that position on minor league deals often don't have a ton of leverage and don't have other options, and particularly this winter when you look at, you know, Brandon Belt still being a free agent and like Luke Voigt just became a free agent. Like there's a lot of other guys in that, you know, similar class that other teams would have options for. So I could imagine Vogelback being asked to sign that and the Blue Jays saying, hey like if you don't sign this like we you're not going to be a big leaguer with us and we'll carry spencer horowitz because we need the flexibility but i don't know that they have asked him to sign that or not if they haven't and if he hasn't signed it and if vogelback ends up off the roster after the first month of the year and Votto comes up then the blue jays have spent four million dollars on this very narrow uh role and utility in that roster spot and it's just another example of them like really like funneling as much talent and as much um just utility or it's it's another example of them really funneling as much talent as possible towards the roster early in the season um and really pushing their tips in to win as many games as possible out of the gate 
Right. And it's ultimately, this is a really big market team, 4 million bucks, even if it ends up being that for a DH spot that, you know, maybe by May, they're both off the roster. Maybe by June, they're both off. Who knows, right? How this could all unfold. And it might not be the most efficient way they spend money this year. But end of the day, it's 4 million on a part-time player. We're not talking about 180 on Blake Snell. We're not talking about 210 for Cody Bellinger. For a big market team, these are expenses that you have to take on. You're trying to win this year. It costs money. This is part of what it costs. So I I think it makes sense to proceed with the best roster you can, even if that means accepting some inefficiencies along the way. And even if it means, like, if we get to a point, let's say, you know, Joey Votto gets some of those at-bats first at extended spring, then potentially heads to Buffalo and builds up. And if he's looking really good, and he is a better option to Daniel Vogelback, well, then you can DFA Vogelback, and you can potentially trade him. Or, as you say, maybe there's the advanced consent option. He's able to, you know, go to the minor leagues um, and stay in the organization that way even better. But ultimately, you have to try to get the most production possible. And I don't see a situation where both Votto and Vogelback are on the team with a Vlad and a Justin Turner, because at that point, you're probably looking at too many players You do too much of the same thing. But I don't think that you necessarily run into that. And maybe by the time Votto's healthy, Justin Turner's dealing with something. Or maybe Vladdy is. You just don't know. So I don't think it's actually a bad situation. I think the way they've played it out so far makes sense. And you just kind of keep letting it play out because it's actually pretty rare that you get to a point in the season where you truly have too many viable options for the Major League roster. Yeah, I I agree. I don't think it would be tenable to have both Fogelback and Votto on this roster in a world where uh, Turner and Vlad are healthy and playing regularly. Like on, you know, on the salary side, like, yes, like for a big market team, it's, you know, relative to, you know, their overall payroll. Yes, it's a very small slice, but we are talking about a team that is well into the luxury tax at this point. And maybe, you know, depending on how you want to calculate the CBT, uh, like, six to seven million bucks maybe even less maybe even only five from that second luxury tax threshold so um you know already running like a franchise record payroll like this could limit what the blue jays can do at the trade deadline or even in season before the trade deadline although every year we do that thing where we're like the blue jays should go out and get somebody in may or in june and that's just not the way the teams operate and it's just not what happens any year like all the activity comes towards the deadline um so it, it really is going to be at that juncture when they can kind of make decisions about and, and look to take on salary and, and try to augment their roster to win games over the final two months and get into the postseason and be as competitive as, as possible so like it's interesting you know like last year they took nathan lucas out of camp last year i think they prioritized you know depth of roster and and long term and and a lot of these other things Uh, it does feel like with some of the decisions they're making right now they're prioritizing how do we win as many possible games in april it's interesting to see them behaving this way you know trying to win as many games as you can in april seems like a good idea (laughs) i think it makes sense um and we've gone granular enough so let's step aside and when we come back we'll go a little bit bigger picture on this team and what's ahead for them in 2024 coming up next on at the letters listen to at the letters ad free on amazon music included with prime welcome back to at the letters for tuesday march 26th 2024 opening week edition of the podcast and we went over the the latest news and developments in the first half but now it's time to go a little bit bigger picture and weigh in on this team as as they begin really a pivotal season. And I guess before we even get into some of the roster stuff, Arden, like, let's just hear your thoughts on where this team sits as far as the arc of this franchise, um, everything on, off the field, fan expectations, Ross Atkins, the GM, um, you know, with a lot of pressure, right? John Schneider facing a lot of pressure. The stadium renovation has occurred. You know, before before we get too far into the weeds here, let's hear your big picture thoughts on what's at stake here. That is a tremendous amount of variables to sum up into 60 seconds here. Uh, I will yes. say it's a 
<laughs> yeah, just just touch on, you know, the entire management, the entire front office, the stadium, the operations, the team itself and fan expectations. Uh, yeah, just a couple things. Um, I think it is an important year for the Toronto Blue Jays. It is potentially a pivot year for the Toronto Blue Jays. And uh, like so much of it just comes down to like what's coming off the books in the next couple of years. Like you've got essentially like almost the entire team <laughs> that could be hitting free agency um, after 25 or 26 and a bunch of guys who are going to be coming off after like 24. Like if you're going to, you know, run it back again, like say the Blue Jays get to a divisional series and bow out in five games and you're like, we're running it back again. Last year, Bo and Vlad in 2025. Well, you're going to need to, to replace Kikuchi and replace a Turner and a Kiermaier and a Garcia and a Danny Jansen. Like there's, there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of moving pieces here for the Blue Jays over the next couple of years. And the biggest thing that they have lacked over the last 12 months, arguably 24 is just upward pressure on their roster from within the organization. Just not a good enough job, in my opinion, of drafting and developing and like supplementing the big league roster with young, controllable talent from within. Like That's the biggest thing this year for me, for the Blue Jays, is they need to produce two or three players who are capable of being above average big league players from within. Like Two to three win players need to be coming out of this system more frequently than they have been over the last couple of years. Otherwise, like there there are likely some pretty lean years ahead for the Blue Jays. Yeah, this is a huge one. There's no question about that. I, I think that it's all about results. It's all about what happens at the major league level. Um, you know, of course, I guess that's slightly, you know, an over the top statement because you do also want to see strides taken in the minor leagues. But end of the day, this is a season where it's about what happens with the major league team and specifically what happens with the major league team in the playoffs. And I understand like you can look at what's happened since 2016 with this team in the playoffs and they're winless, obviously swept in 2020, 2022 and 2023. And you can look at that and, and smart baseball people can look at that and say it's random. You know, the playoffs in baseball are random and that's not just people with the blue Jays who will, who will bring that up when you're talking about, postseason baseball and I understand that I mean I love baseball stats and I love looking at the game through that analytical lens but I think it misses something and I think that you can't just shrug your shoulders and say well I guess you know it was just random the the roll of the dice just didn't go the Blue Jays way nothing they can do I actually think you got to improve your chances as much as you possibly can by building a team that A, wins the division, which I don't think the Blue Jays have a division-winning team on them this year, and then B, if you are going to be in the wild card, better to go in as a 570 win percentage team than a 540 win percentage team, and better to go in with a team that's healthy and rested, better to go in with a team that if you are going to be in that situation, has relievers who are capable of absolutely dominating a game late when when you're in those high leverage situations and you're not handing the ball over to Anthony Bass with the season on the line as they did in 2022. So I think there are measures you can take, even accepting and understanding that baseball is unpredictable and the baseball playoffs are never going to be representative of a team's true talent. I think you can still put your hand on the scale a little bit and help yourself out a little bit and the Jays are obviously trying to do that, but we'll see really how far that can take them. And I, I do think it's all about what happens in October this year. Yeah, you, you know, like how I'm wired. Like I, I see the last four seasons of Blue Jays baseball as like the most successful run of just sustained winning baseball that this team's had since the early 90s. Like you look at four straight winning seasons you look at 89 wins last year 92 the win the year before that 91 the year before that like i haven't gone and done this but if you went and took every team across mlb and accumulated their records over the last three to four seasons like their regular season records i promise you the blue jays are gonna be the top uh so that to me 
is much more impressive than winning a two game wild card series. Like I, I fall much more on the side of the postseason is just like a fun tournament where anything can happen. It's just March madness after, after the season. But I understand that I am definitely isolated in that view and in that take. Um, but I think it also does at least like, if you look at it objectively reveal like how thin the margins are for how people feel about like where a team is at. Like last year, if the blue Jays beat the twins in the, that wild card series um and like there were you know it's not like there were a ton of it's not like the blue jays like got blown out by the twins last year in that series right like what was the cumulative score in the series like five to one you know there wasn't a ton in it um it was three one in game one and two nothing in game two so i mean that's a couple of two run homers from being very very different um so say the blue jays win that series and they go to the ds and they have the same fate that the twins had against the astros and they lose in four games I wonder how differently people would have felt over the course of the offseason and even entering this year if the Blue Jays had just had that small modicum of postseason success last year. If they had just won two postseason games, just two games of then. Course. I, I yeah. bet you that the narratives and the tenor and the the commentary, the discourse would have felt a lot different with only two more wins. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. And there's something that sort of doesn't quite add up logically when you look at it that way because the the whole response is so heightened and, you know, arguably exaggerated because of what happens in those two games. At the same time, we all knew that those two games were going to happen. We all knew that they were going to count. Um, and it those games did expose some of the Blue Jays' flaws. Like Vlad Jr. getting picked off second base. Okay, maybe it's just a moment in time. Maybe... Maybe someone wants to call that random, but I would say it was emblematic of a lack of focus and attention to detail. Or I, I, I want to dial that back. I'll say it was emblematic of a lack of skill on the basis, a lack of good judgment on the basis um, that we saw all season long when the Blue Jays objectively were one of the worst base running teams in baseball. So, you know, that for that to come up in the playoffs, like not a big surprise to me. Um, so, yeah, I think that, when you're looking at four-year windows, I agree. The Blue Jays have been, without a doubt, one of the best regular season teams in baseball over a four-year period. But you don't get a trophy for that. We all know that's not the goal. Um, and I do think that if you're talking about four-year windows for this team since the early 90s, the best four-year window, in my opinion, has to include 15 and 16, where A, they won a division title in that period of time, and then B, they also made it to the ALCS two years in a row. So I wouldn't say this has been more successful than that, even if they have won more regular season games. We're like so off track right now. But if you're putting like, if you're doing a four year window with 15 and 16 in there, then you're including a, like a losing season in some way. Sure. If you're talking a four sure. year, a four year window. So yep. maybe two losing seasons. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And it's, so it's, it's hard for me to say that's more impressive than like the, the winning the Blue Jays have shown in the regular season over the last four years. I've made this argument so many times before. I'm sure people are sick of it, but like to me, like the Dodgers over the last 10 years, even though they've won only once, um, they've won only one world series to me, they've been a dynasty. To me, they've been the best team in baseball. They've been absolutely just phenomenal. It's so, so, so much more impressive to me what the Dodgers have done over the last 10 years in terms of like their success and their play in their regular season, the amount of games that they've won over the course of these six-month marathons that these teams win rather than the occasional club that uh, you know has a pretty good sprint in October. Right. And I mean, that includes three World Series appearances for the Dodgers. I'm not even going to try to count the number of NLCS appearances. Totally agree. They've been MLB's model franchise. Um, you know, if the Jays get to the point that they're losing World Series every couple of years, like that would actually be great. <laughs> that would be that would be many steps ahead of where they are right now. We'll see where it leads. I mean, there is a big gap and the Jays, you know, have have hopes of being one of the elite teams in Major League Baseball. To me, being a wild card team a couple years in a row, it's not that doesn't get them there. They need to do much more, and it has to happen in the playoffs. Even if they're a little bit random, you have to win in the playoffs to be considered really one of those top teams. The Jays are not there yet. The Jays do a lot of things well. They have had a lot of success in the regular season. They have a lot of good players, and they might do some really good things this year, but they have not reached those heights yet. Sure. 
let's get off this before I dig my hole with people any further. How do you feel about the Blue <laughs> okay. Jays' uh, rotation depth? Well, yeah, let's go there. So rotation depth, I said this to Blake the other day. We were talking about this. And my first instinct, if I'm being really honest, is to say that the Blue Jays have bad rotation depth. Okay? Like, that's, like, where my mind goes. That but is, then I do check interesting. Myself. What a take. Yeah. All right. So that's how you gonna defend this one. <laughs> well, I, I'm not I'm just trying to be transparent here, right? Like that's that's honestly where my mind goes. And then I need to check myself as as we do sometimes this time of year or really any time. And I look at some of the other rotations for contending teams around Major League Baseball. And let's take the Texas Rangers. All right, they have Dane Dunning and Cody Bradford rounding out their rotation. And everyone would say the Texas Rangers are a good team. And those are the guys who are in their rotation. The Orioles have Tyler Wells and Cole Irvin in their rotation. The the New York Yankees have Clark Schmidt and Luis Hill in the rotation to say nothing of their six and their seven and their eight. So then at that point, when I look at the Blue Jays rotation, and okay, let's say it's Mitch White. Let's say it's Ricky Tiedemann in a month's time. You know, if all goes well. We'll see how that unfolds. It's Wes Parsons. Maybe it's Paolo Espino. And none of those options are the ideal. But I actually think I'm going to revise my initial gut impulse here. And I don't want to say that their rotation is is suspect or bad. I, I don't believe that it is. I actually think their rotation depth is fine. And you're not thrilled with it. But rarely are you ever thrilled with your number six through eight starters. And I, I think their rotation depth is perfectly viable. Yeah, that I 100% agree with that. Like I I think that, you know, we get so like myopic on one team um that you kind of forget like the greater perspective of the fact that no team in baseball is ecstatic about their number 6, number 7 starter. Like no team has enough pitching. No team is like, "Oh my god, our organizational pitching depth is just like so deep. How what are we going to do with all these capable big leaguers?" Like it just doesn't exist. Um still waiting for, you know, a, like a Fangraphs or a Savant or someone to come up with like a depth metric that can like measure i don't know if you would use like projection systems or like how you would kind of figure this out but that would, that would kind of quantify like organizational depth into one tidy number i know that ben clemens did a lot of writing about that at fangrass recently it's a pretty hard thing to do to just like ass- assess depth team by team across baseball uh, but f- just from a blue jays perspective i just feel like their starting pitching depth this year is a lot stronger than it was last year when coming out of the gates it was like zach thompson and drew hutchison were the guys and then it only took about you know a month of triple a results to realize those were not the guys and those were not the pitchers that the blue jays were going to trust as evidenced by the fact that when alec manoa like pitched his way out of the big leagues and by the way alec manoa given was given a ton of rope last year because the blue jays did not have a better option but once it was like all right like we, like alec manoa cannot start another game for us at the big league level the choice the blue jays made was to go with a four-man rotation for like a month instead of having a fifth guy in there because they didn't have a fifth guy they didn't have someone who they trusted so so this year, at least you have like a West Parsons who the Blue Jays trust. I know he had a uh, tough Blue Jays debut last year, but just like look at the overall body of work and the way he's throwing the ball. I think that there is like a capable back end starter in there. We've talked about Yariel Rodriguez, Paulo Espino. You know what you're going to get. That is somebody who will be reliable for you if you need him to make some starts. And then Ricky Tiedemann, who is like going to be on this team at some point this this year provided he stays healthy like he could have a manoa arc from 2021 remember when manoa went to triple a and was just like vaporizing dudes for like four outings and forced his way to the majors ricky tiedemann could do something similar and be up here in like mid-may and then you've also got like a chad dallas and a cj van eyck and an adam Mako who are like a little bit further removed but could push their way closer to the the big league roster this year so i just think that like relative to where it was last year the blue jays have much better starting pitching depth agreed they seem to be honestly in a pretty good spot um in that respect and this is where gosman coming back just bumps everyone else down a spot. That is huge. That's why that Monday outing for me was was such a big development. But, you know, we've gotten this far in the podcast without really talking about the offense. So let's take stock of where the Blue Jays are at offensively. Clearly 
a huge part of any team's game. It's literally half the game is scoring runs. So um, that is massively important for a team that really underwhelmed in that department last year and underperformed in some cases. So big picture, as you look at this offense, what is your level of confidence that this group can keep the Blue Jays really competitive uh, on a nightly basis? I expect it to be better. If they stay healthy, like I expect Dalton Varsho to be better than he was last year offensively. I expect Vladimir Guerrero Jr. to be better. I expect George Springer to be better. I expect Bo Bichette to take another step and honestly, like maybe mess around and win a batting title and maybe be like a top five MVP finalist. Year before that, Bichette with a high drive to left field, racing back Gonzalez on the track, looking up, it's out of here. Two run home run, Bo Bichette. I, I wouldn't be surprised if all those things happened, but they're going to have to stay healthy and they're going to have to carry over like some of the really promising approach stuff that they showed this spring. Um, like the spring training results for this lineup were incredible. Like there was a ton of guys who were raking. Uh, I don't put a lot of stock into spring training results i do put a lot of stock into process though into how you're getting to those results and you look at the chase rates team wide i mean this was a team that really bought into like the what don mattingly has been preaching about zoning up and getting to your pitch in your part of the zone that you can drive and to not making outs on pitchers pitches and to be you know working more competitive plate appearances seeing more pitches you know kind of like the the justin turner of it all um you saw that up and down the lineup. Guys like Dalton Varsho and Vladimir Guerrero Jr. were just chasing far less. Guys like Alejandro Kirk and George Springer were doing better damage on the pitches they can do damage against, making you know Ernie Clement's quality of contact and and uh, you know extra base hit numbers looked a lot better. Even Isaiah Kiner Falefa like did a really good job of getting to his pitch to drive in spring. That's why he had really good spring numbers. It's no guarantee it's going to carry over um, into the regular season. But like I, I th- it's hard not to be encouraged by like the the process and the approach that the Blue Jays showed up and down the lineup this spring. Yeah, and I think too, as long as we're talking about spring and what we can take away in a meaningful way, to me, we say this every spring, but it's can you get through it mostly healthy? And Danny Jansen, unfortunately for him and for the Blue Jays, will start on the injured list. Otherwise, though, I mean, Justin Turner made it through. Kevin Kiermaier made it through. George Springer did. So you're talking about three guys in their mid to late 30s who made it through and seem to be in a good spot physically to start the season. So that is not something that you necessarily take for granted on a veteran team. And I think that with those guys healthy and ready to produce uh, bounce backs, I think, in store for Varsho and Vlad, among others, they're is the makings there are the makings of a really good offense here and we've talked about this before again i'm not predicting like a top three offense in baseball but i do think they can be in the top third of teams really without reaching too far and they're gonna have to be i mean the pitching in some ways will take steps back this season we talked about the vulnerability in the bullpen off the top so they are going to have to win some eight to six ball games and i think that this group is capable of that yeah, this is going to just way oversimplify something that is a, a lot more complicated uh, than I am expressing it. But I like I think the key for this offense all year is just going to be consistency in swing decisions. And it's just going to be swinging at strikes and not swinging at balls. And the, swikes, so the strikes that you were swinging at are the pitches on the areas of the plate where your swing does damage. And the pitches from the like specific pitcher that night who you have game planned for and prepared for uh, the pitch that that pitcher throws that you want to be executing your swing against. I think if the Blue Jays can be consistent with that over six months, I think the offense can do well. The true test is it's one thing to do it in March like the Blue Jays have. It's another to continue doing it through May and June and July, like when the marathon gets hard, when you get into the middle of it and you're tired and you're carrying like four minor injuries and it hurts to get out of the bed in the morning and you've been, you know, traveling a ton and you're mentally worn out and you're so sick of like Arden asking you questions every day. And it's like a grind to come to the ballpark and it's day game after a night game. And it's like 35 degrees in Atlanta or wherever you're at. You got to drag your ass out there to try to compete. Like, can you have 
the consistency in approach and swing decisions at that time where it gets tough. Like, can you maintain this over the course of a season? Because that's what the best players in this sport do. They are remarkably consistent and routine oriented and disciplined. That's how you put up like really strong six month seasons. So I think that's really going to be the test for the Blue Jays. And it would be a lot easier to accomplish that goal and to pass that test if they have some support. And we've talked before a couple weeks ago on ATL about how, hey, you know, it doesn't necessarily seem like there's someone who's just like bursting through in the upper minors on the position player front. And that, you know, Addison Barger and Elvis Martinez and Alan Roden. Yeah, like they're really interesting prospects. They're legitimately promising players, but they're not right there on the cusp. So as the Blue Jays look to get through the grind of the season and 162 games in 185 days, they would really be in a much better position if one or two of those guys can step up in a meaningful way. And I'll, I'll even include David Schneider in that mix and maybe Ernie Clement in that mix where there will be opportunity for some of these less proven players, some of these younger players. And if Ernie Clement can build on what he did in spring and maybe it's over 250 at-bats and he's able to post a 790 OPS, like how big would that be for this ball club? And I think there's opp- there's always opportunity for guys like that, even on a team where you do have a lot of established players. And so if they can get one or two of those uh, younger players to emerge as viable contributors, that can make the difference between a season where you win 86 and you're on the outside looking in and a season where you win 88 and you're wild card number two. Yeah, if Arelvis Martinez can have like a Babe Schneider-esque arc at some point this summer, right? Where he like comes up like David Schneider did and times a hot streak with a, a point where the Blue Jays have some, uh, you know, some like an injury or something that Arelvis is filling in for and goes out and hits a gang of extra base hits and, and homers and doubles uh, in the span of like three weeks, that would be massive. Pitch. Is hit in the air towards right center field. This is crushed towards the wall, and it's gone. A three-run homer over the wall, giving Buffalo a 4-3 lead. If, uh, like you mentioned, an Allen Roden, like if he can take what are already really elite bat-to-ball skills and amazing barrel accuracy, barrel control, ability to make contact, and add in some power, and maybe take a few more chances and hunt some certain pitches, take some bigger swings, like just leave the yard a bit more and then turn up and do that for the Blue Jays at the big league level. That would be huge because like, just like we said with the pitching depth, like the Blue Jays are going to lean into their position player depth at some point as well. Someone's going to get hurt and someone's going to underperform and something's not going to work out. Like it's always, it's the biggest question of every baseball season. It's the unknown. It's what is going to happen that the Blue Jays are not prepared for, that Arden and Ben aren't anticipating, that none of us are talking about during spring, that we're all going to look back on six months from now and be like, huh, like that thing happened that none of us expected or talked about or thought was going to be the case. This happens in every baseball season. There is something that we aren't currently thinking of that no one's scenario planning for that will arise um, and it'll be up to, you know, the Blue Jays depth, both on the position player side and the pitching side will be the true test of whether they are able to overcome whatever that unknown is. Right. And the more support you get internally, the, the more it simplifies things as you're, as you're trying to backfill later in the season. So for example, if an Ernie Clement does step up, and maybe he's able to really produce offensively and he's kind of your fourth outfielder all of a sudden because he's hitting so well and you just toss him in left field and great that's your go-to when Kevin Kiermeyer needs a day off or when Dalton Varsho does well that's a huge development because it helps you win in the moment but also then that means that once once you get to July you're not sitting there at the trade deadline looking at your roster and saying okay David Schneider didn't really hit Espinal or Espinal's gone Clement didn't really hit or Elvis Martinez isn't quite ready. Okay, now we have to go out. We have to add a right-handed bat because that is a question on this team right now is, is who is that complimentary right-handed bat on this ball club? So that means if you have that internally, then you can go out and, and really focus on getting that big reliever. And that's where your resources can go from a scouting standpoint, from a prospect standpoint. We know they're going to need a big reliever at the deadline. Boom, you can go out and do that. So not to get like four months ahead of things, but I do think that the more solutions you have internally, it does simplify things down the road. 
Sure. And if a Connor Cook or a Mason Fluarty or a TJ Brock wants to emerge from this uh, from internally as like a potential leverage reliever this year, that would be helpful as well. Like this will all play into the melange of uh, you know what makes the Blue Jays successful or not this year but um you know for all the like majoring in the minors that we do on this podcast and throughout the year ultimately like the primary driver of this is going to be the three dudes at the top of the batting order george springer vladimir guerrero jr and Bo bichette probably in that order by the way to start the year fyi but those three those are the guys who are going to make the most played appearances of healthy they're going to have the most impact on this offense i really think that you know as those three go the Blue Jays offense will go. And in 2023, two of those three players underperformed their projections, reasonable expectations of them, what they've done in the past, their obvious potential. And that's probably why the Blue Jays offense was a little bit underwhelming last year and really didn't live up to what you might have expected it to based on all the batted ball data and the hard hit rate and, and all of these things. So if Springer, Guerrero, Bo Bichette can come through with consistent results over the course of the season. All that other little stuff will, uh, you know, be it'll all take care of itself if you have those primary drivers in your offense. Yeah, and Springer and Vladdy, a couple guys who, you know, have had ups and downs in their performance in recent years. And, you know, that's where if you look at the roundtable that went up at sportsnet.ca on Tuesday, or, or excuse me, that's going up on on Wednesday, you will see a lot of responses circling around Vladimir Guerrero Jr. and George Springer, and I think understandably so. These guys are just, it's its huge what, what they can offer at their best, but they haven't always been at their best. And Springer, you know, this is, this is a big chance for him to sort of make good on the biggest contract in franchise history. So we'll see what happens there. But, you know, when I look at this team collectively... It's funny because we were I was I was going through my own predictions for the for the round tables that we do, the playoff predictions for the 2024 season. And initially I had the Blue Jays out. I had them on the outside looking in. And then I looked at them and I looked at Gosman coming back and the Texas Rangers were that bubble team for me. And I ended up bumping the Texas Rangers and I have the Blue Jays making the playoffs. So of course there's so many scenarios where it doesn't go this way, and I can easily see the Blue Jays missing the playoffs. That would not surprise me at all. They have problems um, without clear solutions. So we'll see how it all unfolds. And I don't see the Blue Jays winning this division. But I ultimately do have them as a playoff team for this coming season. Well, it's a good thing the year's about to start before you change your mind again. (laughs) Well, look, I mean, the more information we get, the more likely I am to change my mind. I think that's a rational response to new information. 100%. All right. Well, we will leave it there. 162 games ahead, many more podcast episodes of ATL, uh, somewhere between, you know, zero and 162. We'll see exactly where that number lands. But we will be with you, of course, all season here on the podcast. Thank you so much for listening to us this week. And stay tuned for what's ahead. Thank you as well to our producers, Christian Ryan and Nick Andrade. For Arden Welling, I'm Ben Nicholson-Smith. Thanks so much for listening to ATL. <laughs>